Hello, don't mind me. I'm just sitting here with these dahlias that I grew. Uh, if you know me for any length of time, you've probably heard me speak poorly of dahlias, not because I don't love them, um, but because I've always been so jealous of people who could grow them. Well, it just took me moving across the ocean and now I can grow dahlias because I didn't have the right conditions or didn't have the conditions that they wanted. Um, you can change some variables in in your growing environment and others you're just gonna have to deal with. Um, my choice in Vermont was to not grow dahlias and now that I'm in a whole new place, I tried them and they're happy. <clears throat> they're just for me now, they're not, uh, not a commercial venture at all. But uh, it's pretty exciting. So today we're gonna talk about things that are tricky or things you're having trouble with and try to get to the root of it. Um, I've got a couple other things before we get to all that. If there's a tricky crop you're having trouble with, go ahead and let us know right now. We've got a lot lined up to talk about, but we can always squeeze in some more. You may have some duplicate problems, um, you know, to what people have already submitted. We're here to help you figure it out, okay? Um, I'm excited about this one. I like, I spend a lot of my time, you know, we have quite a team to help you with your orders and to help with the website and all sorts of things. What I usually do is help people figure out what's going wrong. And I really kind of kind of like that puzzle. So uh, so welcome, I'm glad to see you. Oh, before we get too far away, um, Thomas made me a grape margarita. It's grape season in Madeira. It's also mango season and banana season and apple season. Um, we're just amazed at all the fruits that we're still learning grow very well here. So fresh squeezed grape juice turned into a slightly smoky margarita. Um, cheers, it's five o'clock here in Madeira. Happy lunchtime <clears throat> to my friends on the East Coast and good morning to my West Coast friends. Okay, let me, let me show you a new product that's gonna be available tomorrow, um, same time tomorrow. So noon Eastern tomorrow, this product will go up. It's shipping soon in week 43 and 44, okay? Um, this is a Campanula, believe it or not. A new series of double Campanula that have uh, a lot of green in them. The Evergreen series, they last a really long time. Um, these are brand, brand new. There's someone producing them in Holland, but these will be the first time they've been in the US. So this is very much a trial. Um, <clears throat> This is another double white. Here's the kind of stem you can expect on them. And here's some in a production setting. So some of the petal tissue is actually turned into leaf tissue and that's why they have this green color. It's also why they're gonna last, from what I hear, three or four weeks. Um, these are coming out of tissue culture, so they are going to be quite a bit more expensive, but you can get seven or eight stems per plant from what I understand. So I just want to tell you about this one. You know, usually we like to give you a little more time to make decisions. It'll go on sale tomorrow at noon Eastern time. That'd be nine Pacific, same as right now. Um, and these will be shipping this year in week 43 or 44, um, both. But that'll be up to you. Okay, there's announcement number one. <clears throat> I think in my last uh, Instagram Live, I talked a little bit about some new products and new resources coming your way. So I'm gonna tell you a little more about that. So on October 2nd, we will go live with all of our, you know, all the plug products and perennial products that you've come to know from Grow and Sell. We will also, uh, well, Grow and Sell will have a whole lot of uh, additional products, a lot more perennials. We're gonna have so many of those nice hellebores. We just didn't have enough last year, but we've had a year to prepare. So we'll have a wider selection and much better availability. Um, big double echinaceas. You all have really asked a lot about those in the last year. We're going to have them. Again, this all goes on sale on October 2nd. Hopefully a couple of new Lysianthus varieties. I know we all love Lysianthus. And uh, maybe a couple other annual seed grown varieties that you've just asked for. We always like to hear what it is you're looking for because I really like going out there and finding, you know, finding the crop. October 2nd. Also on October 2nd, <clears throat> we will start um, selling mums produced by Three Porch Farm down in Georgia. Um, these are heirloom mum cuttings. 
These will be cuttings that you take cuttings from to produce larger amounts of heirloom mums. Uh, Steve and Mandy are good friends of ours. We've known them a long time. And they asked if we could help sell some of their product. And uh, why not? I think that's a great idea. Um, you know, they're very different than the kind of new cutting edge modern mums, which we don't have access to in the US. But there's some really lovely um, heirloom mums that have been around for decades or even, you know, longer than that. Um, so that'll also go on sale October 2nd. We have another program shipping from the West Coast. So thank you, California growers, for your patience. It gets really, it's gotten a lot more expensive to ship from Pennsylvania to California. Um, yeah, we just needed another option. Um, also, you remember that Grow and Sell, we just filled up their facility last year and there was a period where we couldn't accept orders. Well, we figured that out. We're going to work with another grower. We'll tell you all about that later. Um, it'd be a lot of the same products that we offer from Grow and Sell. But for those of you on the West Coast, you will be able to get them shipped to you much more affordably. Um, I think it's great news. We uh, Eventually, it's going to give us the opportunity to grow more and more products to uh, help supply the needs of the small and medium-sized flower grower in the United States. <clears throat> There's another one that's coming. These won't really go on sale until November. Um, but we'll keep you posted about it. Um, we will be offering some woody perennials this year for the first time. Um, these will actually be bare root woody perennials that are grown in Holland and they're going to be brought to the U.S. and then we will be redistributing them here in the U.S. Um, it's from Colster breeding. If you've ever seen the word magical in front of a hydrangea is one of their main crops. Um, at the moment we don't have their hydrangeas but I think we're going to get some. Um, I have a lot of Calicarpa beautyberry. It's a big big purple berries. <clears throat> uh, we're trying to get some of the white ones too. There's a really neat white one. You know, you don't need to do anything but listen right now. We will uh, talk about these a lot going forward. Um, Cotinus, smoke bush, we're going to have that. Um, Deer Villa, really neat foliage plant. We're going to have three different Ilex verticillatas. Um, these are the winterberry hollies. We're going to have an orange, a red, and a yellow. So yellow and orange are really great for Thanksgiving. Um, and then obviously red for Christmas time, just kind of classic, classic Christmas uh, cut branch. Other one I'm really excited about, um, Symphora carpus, the snowberries. <clears throat> You'd think they'd be white or that they would come during the snow time. Um, some in fact are white, but they actually start looking pretty good in August, August and September. So I actually have three different groups, an early, a medium, or an early, mid, and late, um, in white, in pink, and blush. So I think maybe eight or nine different snowberries. So you've asked for this. It's been something I've been trying to get my hands on for a long time. Um, another thing that's still developing will be um, some peonies. I'm actually going to bring in some nice big three to five eye Dutch peonies that can ship with these woodies in the springtime. I know a lot of people like to plant peonies in the fall. You can also plant them in the spring if they've been stored properly. Um, this is not some kind of end of season clearance, cooler clearance. These are peonies that are being dug in the next couple weeks in Holland. They will be frozen and shipped cold. So you'll have very fresh, very healthy, uh, big rooted peonies. So there's more stuff coming in the works, but I wanted to just let you know what's, you know, some of the things we're working on. Today, we're gonna talk about problems. My theory is, well, every plant has its own needs. <clears throat> and as a flower farmer, we work for the plants. Okay, it's great if you can find a plant that fits into your life and just is it there whenever you feel like getting it in the ground and will still work. In reality, your life needs to focus around the plants if you want this to be a profitable, you know, venture long term. Um, maybe you're a gardener and still you take pride in growing something to perfection. You work for the plant. So your job is to understand the needs of the plant and figure out when you can offer those conditions. So I think it's kind of backwards of the way a lot of people think about it, but in this time of climate change with floods, with heat, with late freezes, with you name it, um, the needs of the plant are not going to change. We need to understand what the plants want and try to figure out how we give it to them. There's a lot, a lot of variables. Um, you know, this is sort of like day one horticulture or even, you know, biology class. Obviously, plants have certain temperature requirements, largely based on where they're from in the world. Um, that can be air temperature and soil temperature. 
both can have you know drastic effects on a plant. Fertility, that can be the health of your soil, the nutrients that are available in your soil, or it can be the fertilizers you're putting on, be, the, be that uh, you know conventional or organic fertilizers. Um, water, not just how much water, but what's the quality of your water? You know, some waters are very hard, some are very soft, some have a lot of calcium, some really could use more calcium. Another big consideration that we don't really think about, <clears throat> unless you just don't have water and then everything goes wrong. Day length, um, almost every cut flower has some kind of day length response. And then also light intensity. So think about wintertime, you're not putting on sunblock to go outside, but if I go out with this bald head in July, I'm gonna get toasted. So uh, light intensity has a lot to do with where the, you know, where the sun is in the sky, how close it is to the earth, and your plants are very aware of this. Um, even carbon dioxide levels, you know, in a commercial greenhouse setting, sometimes they are actually increasing the carbon dioxide in that space on purpose to, uh, you know, maximize the growth of the plant. <clears throat> One way you can do that is just have circulation fans in your, you know, in a high tunnel. You can't really do that in the field. And you'll see a big difference in the un uniformity in your crop. If you ever had a high tunnel, growing in a high tunnel, you might see like a little dip in one section of your bed. It could be the same crop. And you're kind of curious why. Well, it could be that that area is just depleting carbon dioxide too fast. Those in the outer edges have a little more access to it. But by the time you know, the air isn't moving enough in that space. So even those circulation bands will help with diseases. They also help keep carbon dioxide kind of at similar levels throughout the tunnel. <clears throat> So these are the fa factors that we know about that we can control depending on our conditions. You know, if it's 100 degrees out, you can't really cool your greenhouse to fill 55. Um, but you can heat a greenhouse to make it warmer, harder to control conditions in the field, of course. Um, we'll talk about all that on a case-by-case -case basis. And there's other factors that you don't know if they're going to happen, but eventually they're going to happen. So these would be mostly your pathogens and pests. So, we can, you know, there's some bacterial diseases for sure. There's a lot of fungal diseases. They're probably the biggest one. And then there's, let's call them bugs. These would be your mites, your aphids, tarnished plant bugs, cucumber beetles, corn borers, thrips. Um, all things to consider. A lot of which, if you're able to manipulate the environment, you can control a lot of these things. Okay, we're going to jump right into it. Like I said, if you have questions, if you have problems, um, even some photos. I've got a couple photos that customers have sent in. Um, so let's just actually start with some of those. Thanks for your patience while I find them here. Getting close. All right, maybe I'm not gonna find the right photo. Sorry about that. <clears throat> um, someone from Nebraska sent me some pictures of some scoop scabiosa. Um, he sent, actually really informative, gave me a lot of information, which really helps if you are asking for help. You know, um, there's a, there's so, sometimes just planting something at the wrong time of year is all you need to throw it off track. So scoop scabiosas, um, Got them in May, Let's see, May, May 4th or 5th. Transplanted them into a pot because the soil wasn't ready. First of all, good job. If you, you know, receiving plugs, you can't get them in the ground in a week, definitely put them in something bigger. Um, they didn't go in the ground until end of May, almost early June. And then there's some other problems. <clears throat> so the first thing I'm noticing, so I went back, um, if you go to Google and just Google, um, the name of your location and historical weather data, you can actually find out what the weather's been like. You might not remember exactly what happened every day in the last few months, especially during the growing season, it's hard to keep track of it. But if you look back, it can really give you some, some info. So I happened to look in early June, this customer was experiencing temperatures in the upper 80s. Not long after that, they were hitting in the 90s. So, and we talked a lot about scoop scabios in the past, they like it cool. They don't wanna freeze hard, they can have a little frost, but they like it cool. You know, I also looked back at hard freezes throughout May and even back into April. And if the customer had planted in late April, these plants would have established more slowly, gotten the roots into cool soil under low, under uh, shorter days with lower light intensity. And that's what the plant wants. First, it wants to grow roots so it can get a nice, 
not really rosette of growth, but just a, a massive leaves that will help support these stems later. So first step was probably receiving them a little bit too late um, and then getting them in the ground almost a month after they came in. Good job for putting them in a pot. Um, there was something else I noticed in the photo. They had a, I also saw that some of them were turning green, which is a not very common thing to have happen in a scoop scabiosa. You see that a lot in more daisy family plants. Um, well, asters for one, the virus is called aster yellows disease. And the virus is spread by either usually leaf hoppers or grasshoppers. Um, it'll make the center of things turn yellow. Sometimes you start seeing leaves growing in the middle, they'll branch in weird ways. The photos looked a lot like aster yellows. Also, the plants were growing in black landscape fabric. So when you start hitting 85s and 90s in the soil, you're getting into the hundreds or above. Um, you know, silver or white mulch would have been a better option, especially if you're you know, kind of pushing the late end of when you could plant. And then there was a lot of weeds. Uh, weed control, you know, weeds take, they take that nu those nutrients, they take the water away from the plant. So if you're seeing a plant that's struggling and your bed is just full of weeds, well, then that's something you can control and you, you will see a lot better results um, if you do control it. You know, I, I hear a lot of people talk about, oh, I have horrible weed pressure. Well, weed pressure is really just a lack of weed control. You have to figure out what you're gonna do about it. And it's not easy, I don't like weeding, but it has to be done. Um, Luckily, after a few years of doing it, being on top of it, you will see um, that weed load um, decrease, but it's a, it could be a long process. Okay, <clears throat> I'm just gonna go down my list here. Um, someone else sent me a photo of some straw flowers. Again, I'm sorry, I don't have them queued up properly. Um, they weren't thriving. Um, this person started their own from seed. I'm happy to help answer the question though. They grew to 12 inches and then just stopped and stayed there all summer. This person is in Alaska. Um, let's say they have a zone three winter. I don't know how warm it usually gets in the summertime. They did say it was quite chilly all of June and July um, with highs in the mid sixties most days. Straw flowers like a cool start. They don't really like to be as cold as some of the cool, you know, the cool, the cool season annuals, but they like it a little on the cooler side when you plant them. Um, even around 55 is great. If it stays below 55, they're really not gonna flower well. So I assume this person is probably seeing nighttime temperatures drop below 55 if it was you know, only in the 60s in the daytime. Um, at those cooler temperatures, they're just not gonna flower. They're also gonna be more prone to root rot diseases. Some root rot like Fusarium and Lysianthus, you'll notice it just collapses the plant. Others, it'll just weaken the plant and they're really not gonna take off. Um, so I think you probably have a combination of uh, just didn't have enough heat Maybe it was rainy during that temperature. I don't have that information at the moment. Um, but yeah, they just maybe got off to a weak start and then never had the right conditions. You know, ideally they stay in a 70 to 75 degree range. They're from, I think Australia, maybe South Africa. Um, so they have a slight, a cool, a coolish winter and then kind of a, um, a moderate temperature summer, um, generally with low humidity. So a lot of rain can really affect straw flowers um, heat spikes can hurt them. I think that's probably what was happening there. Um, just my two cents worth. Okay, we had a lot of people ask about asters. So let's get into asters. So if we're talking about China asters, this would be uh, genus Calistifa, the annual type asters, not the, not the perennial asters, the New England asters that are probably starting to flower um, you know, in the roadsides around much of North America right now. Someone says they're prone to rust and botrytis and root rot. Someone said, should I be pinching to get more usable stems? I'm getting a spray with the first flower, <clears throat> a spray, but then the first flower needs to be cut out before it's sold because it looks bad. Um, someone else agreed they had the same problems with, rot, with rust and fungal issues. On um, this person, uh, Stone Circle Farms actually interplanted their asters with other plants to help the disease from spreading. I think that's a really clever idea. Something that I would I would try if you're having some problems. Um, you know I love books, right? So we have, well, if you don't have this one, you need it. Um, specialty cut flowers. I think they might be working on a new edition of it. This is it. Um, edition number two. Judy Lashman, the director of Association of Specialty Cut Flower Growers, um, is one of the authors, along with Alan Armitage, who's a kind of a horticultural rock star. Um, there's a lot of information here and I read 
I read through every entry I could to help with this talk today. Um, while I'm talking books, you know, I mentioned we're getting into the, the woody, the woody cut branch world. Um, this woody cut stems for cut flower growers, also from the ASCFG. You can get both of them on the website right now. Um, if you don't have them, they're really great assets to have in your library. And this is a really great wintertime thing to do, to go back, look at your historical weather, uh, weather underground. Like I said, you can just Google it and you'll get to the results. See what it was like. It's like, where, where did you get off track? When could you have maybe planted earlier? You know, sometimes you could have planted even six or eight weeks earlier, but you just had in mind that you should plant on May 1st. But the actual observed conditions in your location might tell you otherwise going forward, okay? Um, there's 10 pages about asters in this book alone because they've been grown commercially as a cut flower for a really long time. And yes, they actually have a lot of problems. And that may be why we think of them as a little bit old fashioned because a lot of people don't grow them because they're a bit fussy. But let's just talk about what they want and you can decide if you have those conditions. So we know about long day plants and short day plants. Long day plants tend to flower when it's above 12 hours, maybe 14 hours of daylight. Short day plants, usually when you're dropping below 12 into the 10 hours of daylight per day. Asters are a little weird. Um, they need long days to initiate bud. So they're really they're long day plants. But once the days get short, they make better flowers and they finish the, the blooming process faster. So the ideal situation is that you grow asters until you get them as tall as you want under long days, and then you switch them to short days. Well, easy to do in the summertime because they really want to be like above 14 hours of daylight, especially you growers in the north, you definitely have that. Um, you know, very, very southern part of the United States and Florida, you probably don't actually reach that 14 hours, but you have, you have enough light. To extend your light, you could just hang incandescent bulbs over your field if you really wanted to be an expert or a show off. You don't really have to, nature's gonna do this for you. You'll get long days in the summer and then right now you probably see your asters flowering because the day length is shortening. So they were triggered to flower into those long days and then they're gonna flower more rapidly once the days start to get a little bit shorter. Um, ideal temperature range for asters is above 55, but below 86. Um, so wait until after your chance of frost, wait until you're kind of on the upswing temperature wise. But 86, a lot of people definitely are getting higher than that pretty often these days. Um, maybe why you see these grown in coastal areas very well. You're not seeing such huge temperature spikes if you're near a big body of water. Um, but if you're seeing 90s and 100s, it might not be a crop for you unless you grow them at a different time of year. Um, sometimes you get too many of those laterals growing. Um, and it turns out that long days actually the longer the day is, the more those are inhibited and you'll get more of a central, you know, more of a focal flower in the middle. You can always pinch that first bud out if you prefer, you know, the, the spray, the spray effect. Um, I kind of like the spray effect because you just get a lot of flowers, you know, from one stem. They're really great for making bouquets with one or two of those with a few other larger focal flowers and you have a, you know, a perfect market bouquet. Um, if you really want a big central flower, you can pinch off those laterals, but that's going to take you quite a long time. You're going to plant them four to eight plants per square foot. So if you're using standard support netting, that's you know one one or two per square. Um, I would say if you're trying to grow more of a spray type, then you would put one per square because that's going to be quite a wide inflorescence once it blooms. If you're looking for more taller, you know taller stem single flowers, I would plant them closer, so like two per square or eight plants per square foot. Um, they're susceptible to fusarium. They are susceptible to Phytophthora, tarnished plant bugs, thrips, spider mites, leaf miners, rust. That's quite a lot. <clears throat> so we need to understand each of those separately. I'm not gonna get into the control of all of these. Fungal issues are going to be your biggest problem. And we're gonna talk about rust on snapdragons in a little bit. So what makes rust or what makes, same really goes for botrytis. Um, there's some other, fungal diseases. Almost all fungi need water. They need moisture in order to uh, germinate. It's not quite the right word, but you get a spore that lands on a leaf. It'll hang out there until it, the conditions are correct for it to germinate and infect that leaf. So part of why, you, another reason you really like good airflow, especially in a high tunnel, you know, that 
usually a plastic cover really prevents some of the wind from affecting your crops. But those circulation fans keep things moving. So you might have a spore blow in and then it will hopefully just keep blowing out or maybe it's on the leaf and then it blows off and isn't accumulating. In the field, it can be tricky. <clears throat> um, I don't know anyone who's doing, uh, you know, fans in their field, it would be a great idea. But uh, a little wider spacing, perhaps, if you had a, have a lot of fungal issues. Overhead watering can be really uh, problematic if you are experiencing fungal issues. You don't want that leaf to sit wet for more than a couple hours. So water in the morning if you have to do overhead watering, hopefully on a sunny day when you will you know, dissipate a lot of that humidity. Um, use drip irrigation so you're not getting water on the foliage. But what if you get a rainstorm and you're growing in the field? What if you have a week of rain and things are just sitting wet? Um, you're going to see fungal issues. And I think that's why we're seeing quite a lot of fungal issues this year from people who maybe haven't had them before because there was a lot of sustained moisture and, uh, and rain in a lot of the U.S. So it can come from heavy dews. It can come from irrigation. It can come from rain. So you really try to keep your plant leaves as dry as possible. That's going to save you a lot of headache um, in terms of fungal diseases. <clears throat> One more thing on... Uh, Asters, Sakata has a really great tutorial. I think if you just Google, well, Matsumoto is their kind of their standard uh, um, aster series named after Mount Matsumoto in Japan. Um, if you just Google Matsumoto culture, I think it'll actually take you to the Sakata um, tutorial. It's really a lot of information about growing asters. Um, you can be really, you know, I think there's people who their entire life has been growing these types of asters. They're very popular worldwide, but they are a little bit tricky. You know, they're not just a sunflower that you can toss the ground in the soil and stand back. It just doesn't happen that way. Um, great. A little bit problematic. They need a lot. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be honest, but it is doable. <clears throat> so uh, Jennifer Persack in Marshfield, Vermont, speaking of a lot of rain, um, we probably heard about all the flooding that happened in Vermont. Obviously it means that things were really wet. Um, Jennifer loves Bells of Ireland. She's been growing them in outside and in a tunnel. Um, they've been looking great, but they've been developing a fungal leaf spot that spread so fast in the last two years. <clears throat> There's a, another fungus called Cercrospora. Um, it acts a lot like rust and like botrytis. If you've got prolonged moisture on the leaves from dew, from irrigation, from rain, um, it's gonna, if you've got it in your area, it's gonna catch on and spread. Now, a lot of seed comes with this little fungus uh, in the seed. So, you know, what Grow and Sell uses is what they call plug, plug quality seed, which has been, I believe, steamed before it is used. It is definitely a lot more expensive than what you see from, I don't know, more mom and pops type uh, seed catalogs or organic seed catalogs, um, who are probably just Okay, sorry, I had a little blip in my internet, so I hope I'm back. Um, so I believe the problems of, with Bells of Ireland were again related to um, prolonged moisture. Try to increase your airflow, maybe space your plants a little bit further apart and try to keep them dry. <clears throat> Here's a fairly common uh, complaint about a new crop. So Tilotus. Um, it looks kind of like Celosia. It's in the amaranth family. I think Celosia is as well. From Australia, a really beautiful Australian native. We've really, in the past, only had um, pretty short. There's a, there's a variety called Joey that's been around for a little bit. New one called um, Matilda, which can get taller. However, the real trick there is it can't get cold. It really wants to stay above I had said 55, there is a new um, culture guide that Benari has put out. Benari's a breeder of, um, well, you know, the Benari zinnias for sure. Um, German breeder that came up with this new variety. Um, they say above 65. So really wait to plant this into midsummer warm soil. Don't let it get a chill. And that's gonna give you a much better chance of getting some good height on it. Um, I think that's the main, the main issue I see with Tilotus. Um, without having more information. Um, that said, I just saw a Dutch grower post a video today and their sims were maybe 16 to 18 inches. They were not giant. I do see photos of it getting, you know, 36 inches. So I believe it really wants more heat than a lot of people are giving it. Um, so 
sorry, just out of the corner of my eye, I saw the comment uh, here from Six Duchess Farm. Anything to recommend for preventing asters from aster yellows from reaching asters and rubecchia? It's spread by generally leaf hoppers or grasshoppers. <clears throat> so I think an old technique, which I read about right here in the Specialty Cut Flowers book, was that people used to plant out their aster beds and then keep them completely covered in a reme type fabric until the plants were budded. So probably two and a half, three months undercover just to keep the insects off. Once you have buds, the yellows doesn't have enough time to get in there and mess up everything. So it's really about excluding insects. I mean, you could try to spray them nonstop, but I just don't think that's a good use of uh, time or very nice to the environment. And you're not gonna get every last leaf hopper or grass grasshopper. Um, yeah, they actually pick up a little bit of it from one plant and they take a bite of the next plant and it spreads and then proliferates in that plant and then they'll spread it on and on and on. So it's a, it's a virus, but it's more of an insect issue than it is a viral issue. Let's see, we've got a new comment coming here. Um, Someone asked about biofungicides, kind of like root shield. Um, that, that's going to be a great, a great idea for any time you're seeing uh, Fusarium, Phytophthora, any root rot organisms. If you're seeing that, by all means, consider a biofungicide. There are certainly chemical fungicides that would be helpful as well. <clears throat> all right, back on track. Chocolate Cosmos. Um, first thing to know about Chocolate Cosmos is they are a pretty piddly small little flower. They are very closely related to dahlias. Some people think they are a type of dahlia. Um, like some botanists think they should be considered dahlias. They make tuberous roots, just like dahlias do. You can dig them in the fall like a dahlia, and the roots look very much the same, and treat them like dahlias. They want to be on the warmer side. They want to be in a sheltered spot. Um, obviously, they're a little bit smaller, so they're not going to get... Uh, they can't hold their own as much as a big dahlia plant can. So I would try to grow them above 60. Don't let them get cooler than that. Um, they don't want to sit in water, but they obviously want regular access. I just learned that chocolate cosmos until 2010, there was only one type of chocolate cosmos. They probably were extinct in the wild and everything that was grown worldwide was just a clone of the same plant, either from dividing root tubers, so those uh, tuberous roots, or taking cuttings. Um, it wasn't until around then that someone found a different fertile plant and they started doing a little bit of breeding, but it's a fairly, what you grow is very much like the wild chocolate cosmos, um, which I think is a pretty neat thing. So, you know, some things have been so developed for centuries, but what you are seeing is essentially what, ha what happens in the wilds of Mexico or used to, we think they might be extinct. Um, if someone has really great luck with chocolate cosmos, let me know. I want to Felicia would love to interview you. We'll write you up, do a little blog post about it because it's, um, they're small. I used to buy them in from Holland, get them from Japan on occasion. They're never a big flower, but just that little chocolate brown. I think that it's chocolate brown and also smells like chocolate is just kind of mind blowing. Um, but they might not work for everyone. So it's, it maybe isn't you. Um, you just might not have exactly what they want. <clears throat> Um, someone's having trouble with Cosmos. I did a little deep dive into Cosmos myself because I also never had great luck with them when I grew them in Vermont. There's a couple things to know about Cosmos. This would be Cosmos bipinatus, the standard, you know, generally shades of pink and white. Um, we're starting to see a little bit of apricot and yellow coming into the bipinatus types. But, uh, yeah, old series like Sonata Versailles. Sorry, I almost said Versailles. My, my Kentucky's coming out. Um, let me get down to my notes here. I think one main thing, one reason I had a problem with Cosmos is that my soil was too rich. They had too much, nutri <laughs> too much nutrition. Um, you really want to withhold nitrogen because you, if you've ever seen a Cosmos plant just get covered in lots and lots of green foliage. Um, well, that's just a, a lot of nitrogen making that happen. Okay, cosmos also are short day plants, so they naturally will set flowers with the shortening days of late summer. That said, they will eventually flower regardless of how much light they're getting. That's what they call a, uh, a facultative long day plant. Um, 
So I made a few notes that I'm scrolling for um, your first cut. You, know, you can pinch your Cosmos quite low. You know, some, there's kind of the old adage that if you want long stems, you need to cut long stems. So there's a the deeper you cut, then the regrowth is going to be a lot taller. Um, okay, we might get back to the Cosmos. I'm sorry, I made some notes, but they're getting lost in my big mess here. Um, so I think generally, if you're having trouble with Cosmos, it's probably because your soil is too good. Plant them in kind of the worst gravelly soil you can. It'll keep this height down. It'll keep them from being too lush, and it'll actually encourage them to flower. Um, annual flocks. We haven't, we've never sold annual flocks before, but I think we're going to start this year. It's on the list for grow and sell to find. Um, they're so beautiful and they have that nice little fragrance. Some of the newer colors are really quite lovely. The real trick with annual flocks, well, there was a time when annual flocks was a two foot tall crop. <clears throat> then as, you know, trends have changed, the breeders have made them shorter and shorter and made them kind of going out um, sideways rather than upwards. Well, that's not really helpful for us. So the better colors tend to be more recent developments, but they tend to also be dwarfer plants. So we can do some things to tease them to get a little taller. Um, I'm, on the, I'm on the hunt for some really old flocks that actually will still get tall. I haven't found it yet, but I'm looking for it. Um, I read about it in old books from you know 100 or more years ago. The main thing to do is to crowd them a little bit. And so at least six inches close, maybe four inches. So again, four to eight plants per square foot. And then you gotta pinch them a bunch. You know, every, probably for the first three or four weeks of their life, at least, anytime you see a flower, you've gotta take it off. Now, if you just plant them and wait for them to get tall and they're just kind of flowering on short little stems sideways, the presence of that flower will prevent the plant from making more shoots. So take off the flower, it's got to make a new shoot to try to flower again. Any plant's only goal is to flower so it can set seed. And if you interrupt that process by cutting it, it's going to try again. Not all will, but a lot will try and try again. So you just got to keep cutting those flowers off. What you're doing is you're building a root system and you're building kind of a crown of foliage that can capture the sunlight and can force that next stem to be taller. So don't let the flower hang out because it's going to go to seed. The plant thinks, job done. I don't need to try to flower anymore. Well, if you want tall flowers, you got to pinch off all the short ones and just keep doing that until they start getting taller. Being crowded will also force them upwards. You know, if you give them 12 or 18 inches, they're just going to become a nice little muffin shaped, meatball shaped thing. And it's not going to be what you want. Um, so crowd them and pinch them, pinch them, pinch them, probably for at least a month or six weeks after you plant them. The same can really go for pansies. I know uh, people have been trying to grow cut pansies. Some have better luck than others. It's really a case of crowding them. And you know you want to keep pinching the, pinching the flowers off, even pinching the centers out, so you get more and more side shoots breaking. Eventually, they will just kind of by competition have to get tall. All right, we're going to talk about rust and snapdragons. There might be a not, there's probably not a lot to say after my previous talk about uh, well, other fungal diseases. <clears throat> Someone got some plugs from, from us in the fall and in the spring. And then at the same time, they had some out, some in the tunnel, some in the field. They all got rust. Well, rust is pretty ubiquitous. It's been around since the 1800s. Um, first found in California, actually, but now it's worldwide. Um, if you had received plug plugs with rust, you would have seen it uh, on arrival. You know, it doesn't really care how old the plant is. It's not, they wouldn't have been carrying the rust that showed up later. The rust is probably just in your environment or it's pretty, like I said, ubiquitous, so it's everywhere. <clears throat> it's just hanging out and waiting for the right conditions to happen. Unfortunately, the way we grow snapdragons, spacing them really close together, you know, you've got, these are all stems. There's not a lot of room for air movement in there. So it's probably later in the life of the plant when they start all growing up and becoming a solid mass. That's probably your most susceptible time. Also just the water that the plant gives off from transpiration makes the humidity really high in between the plants. So anytime above 80%, that is, you don't even have to have you know, free liquid water on the leaves. That will make it worse. But above 80%, that's all that little fungal spore needs to germinate and infect the plant. Now the parts interior of your bed, 
the most crowded parts of the bed are the parts that are going to get it first. You're not really going to see it. They'll probably reproduce. They actually make pustules. Uh, but uh, then the spores just spread everywhere and pretty soon it takes down a whole crop and it can happen really fast. So what do you have to do? Well, you have to try to reduce your humidity. That can be difficult, especially if it's raining for four days straight. Um, air circulation is going to be a really big factor in controlling this one. You want those fans blowing, you know, this horizontal airflow nonstop. You don't want it to ever get too humid in between your Snapdragons. The other kicker is the rust spores germinate best between 50 and 70 degrees. Um, that's exactly kind of the temperature range we aim for with Snapdragons in the time when the Snapdragons are the happiest. So drip irrigate, keep your leaves dry, try to keep that air moving, try to reduce humidity if that's at all an option. Um, there are certainly fungicides if that's your thing. There's my speech on rust. Um, it really goes for most fungal diseases as well. Yeah, it's everywhere. Um, so if, if you can't control the environment and the conditions, then really a fungicide is your only choice. I'm not qualified to tell you what fungicide. Um, if you Google Snapdragon rust, you will see so many documents. Um, University of Massachusetts has some really good resources. I think, um, yeah, a lot of universities have information about this. It's been around a long time, been a problem a long time. Uh, someone's another Snapdragon problem, not about rust. Um, Sweet Bee Farm in Michigan, very sandy soil. They grow but don't have full flower spikes. What am I doing wrong? I'm guessing your soil might just be too sandy. Uh, they need to, you know, sand can be great um, for drainage, but it doesn't hold on to water. So I would try increasing your uh, organic matter, hang on to a little bit more of that water. Also, your nutrients run, run right out of sandy soil as well. I think that might be the problem. This is maybe you planted too late. I don't know when you planted. Snapdragons, really like a cold start to life. You can plant them in the fall, probably where you are. Um, if not, plant them in late late winter when you're still getting some frost. Right down to 20 degrees, no problem. <clears throat> um, got Remy and Rose in Denver, Colorado suggests that preventing rust and snapdragons uh, can be accomplished by transplanting in earlier, early April or March. Um, yeah, great. Maybe you get a little more of the plant growth before you start getting those more humid conditions and those more favorable temperatures for um, spore germination. All right. Uh, Stark blooms in Red Hook, New York. They have stock. It was field grown uh, in raised beds in the field. They have perfect conditions for them. Cool weather, no radical temperature swings, proper irrigation, still paltry results. Is it not worth it to grow it in the field? Um, I would argue with the perfect conditions because if you didn't get a perfect result, then something was wrong. Um, not judging anyone. I have killed more plants than all of you combined. And uh, I just kind of like it when I kill something because it gives me a chance to figure out like, what does this plant actually want? Because I'm learning here in Madeira, everything I thought I knew about plants is not quite correct. A lot of things we think really want it hot. Um, it's not that they want it hot, it's that they don't want it cold. And vice versa, a lot of stuff we think really needs to be cold. Well, no, it just can't take the heat. It doesn't have to be 30. It's, it's fine at 55, but it doesn't want to go above 75. So, um, yeah, the fun thing about this, this field and this world is that uh, if you're interested, you're going to keep learning your whole life, and I hope you do. <clears throat> so, my... Notes on stock, they like a cold start, just like snapdragons. I always transplant them at the same time as snapdragons. Um, if you're zone six, seven or warmer, maybe you're six, you could try them in the fall. Otherwise, plant them in very early spring, late winter, when you're still getting some frost. They want to go into cold soil. Snapdragons are really a bit more forgiving than stock. Stock has a strong taproot. You cannot hold it in its tray. It needs to go right in the ground as soon as it arrives, at least within a week. If you can't get it to it right away, as in today, put it in the cooler until you get to it on Friday. Um, but still get it in the ground in that first week because you don't want it to get root bound. That will stunt your growth. Stock is hungry, likes a lot of fertility. Um, make sure it's going into rich soil in the first place. Likes a lot of water, doesn't want to stand in water. Um, so good drainage, but organic, high organic content, moisture retentive soil. 
I think that's my stock speech. I, in Vermont, I always planted it in a high tunnel because by the time I could get into my fields, it was May and June sometimes, and that's just a little late. Um, they really, they really like to establish in the short days going into long days. Plant them under long days, they don't all know what to do. So maybe just try moving up your planting date a little bit um, and give them more food. And that would be my, again, I don't, I don't know all the variables here. That's just some things I happen to know about stock. Um, okay, so I'm in Kansas City, field planted stock. First time growing, all they produce were leaves, no stems or flowers. I mean, I guess you may be planted too late. <clears throat> Sometimes they need the cool temperatures to set buds. Um, they're not going to try to flower under cold temperatures. Under cold temperatures, they will only grow roots and, you know, gain height. So you really want that kind of cold, darker, shorter day period before a longer, warmer period um, to make stock happy. Again, stock is one of those that just doesn't want a bad day ever. So you really need to think like the stock and your world needs to revolve around its needs. You can't just forget about it. You can't let it dry out one day. You can't think, oh, I'll get to it next weekend. Um, not with stock. <clears throat> when you start doing that, you will um, see really great results. <clears throat> mm. Back to Cosmos, I found my note I was looking for. Um, studies have shown, I believe, again, from this book, that more than 14 hours of daylight will delay flowering. Again, I mentioned the cosmos are a short day plant. Short days trigger flowering. They will eventually flower in almost any condition unless you're more than 14 hours of day length. Um, and those of you in the north certainly are above 14 hours of day length. So if you're having trouble getting seeing buds on your flowers, you're probably gonna have to wait until your day length drops below 14 hours until you really start seeing uh, those buds. So it might mean that you don't need to plant them out so early. You could wait a little later and you plant them out when there's 14 hours, get a little height on them. And then as the days naturally shorten, you're gonna get better flowering. Um, it's really hard to answer questions for the entire country. We have so many zones and microclimates and well, also with climate change, nothing is as it was. Uh, have you seen this Our Universe program on Netflix with Morgan Freeman? There was a thing that hit me the other night um, and he said that nothing about today is the same as yesterday, or nothing about today is identical to yesterday. And I thought it was really true because nothing about this week or this year is the same as last week or last year. Conditions are always changing. It's never the exact same variables at the same time. So it's part of what makes it tough, part of what makes it fun. Uh, Sunseeker Flower Farm says double net cosmos. Or maybe that's a, I don't know if that's a variety or if they're suggesting two layers of netting. Um, <laughs> Feel free to clarify. Um, we do have a couple of new Cosmos varieties coming um, to the grow and sell list, so we'll have a we'll have some better varieties. Okay, someone is having trouble with Hypericum. Um, full sun, sandy soil, but it just withered away. Again, I think Hypericum really likes uh, moisture retentive soil. I think they do really well in uh, the Pacific Northwest, where they. At least in the wintertime, they're getting a lot of rain. There's the soils tend to be very rich um, and beautiful. Um, total side note, I just saw Lenny, Lenny Larkin from B-Side Flower Farm, a good friend of mine. She posted some new soil that they've just tilled up and it's looked like brownie batter, just beautiful. Lenny also um, is asking people if they're interested in her um, profitable flower farming Profitable Flower Farming. Sorry, Lenny, I'm forgetting the name of your book exactly. Um, we talked with Lenny a couple months ago about her book. You can now pre-order this on Amazon. It's a really important thing to do so that the publisher knows how many copies to get out into the world. So again, there's my little plug. I meant to do this at the very beginning. Um, Flower Farming for Profit by Lenny Larkin. Look on Amazon. I think that is the only place you can order it now, but go on and pre-order it and it'll ship in the winter time, I think. Um, we're really proud of Lenny. Uh, ASCFG board member, friend of mine. She's been working for a couple years really seriously on this um, to help with the business side of what we're all doing. <clears throat> okay. I have a few more questions that have come in since we started. Let's see if I know the answers. And if not, I'm gonna throw them out to you and maybe you can help me out. Um, the Finneyman Larkspur from Seed. Um, Larkspur, I don't have great experience with growing it from seed. 
Um, generally needs a bit of a chilling period, same with delphinium, so you can maybe sow it and put your flat or your pots in the fridge for a few weeks before you sow it, before you try to germinate it. Larkspur, you can also just direct sow. I think it's quite happy if it gets a bit of chill um, where, where it's going to end up growing. Uh, someone's having trouble with Silosia. All I can tell you is it really wants it hot. I'm not sure if the problem is um, sometimes, you know, the Neo Bombay, the big crested types, you can't pinch those. Um, but the more plumosa types you generally can. Um, I'm happy to help with a few more details. Okay, someone got their first frost in northern Minnesota last night. Sorry about that. Actually, this is when that happens. In Vermont, we would always get it right around September 15th. Um, what's a good frost-hardy big bloom? I'm assuming we're talking a focal flower. Um, a lot of things are hardy, frost-hardy when they are babies, but they are not frost-hardy when they have a flower. I can't really think of flowers that you can freeze reliably. Um, there's some studies being done to try to maybe freeze peonies and tulips a little bit, but those are spring flowers. They wouldn't be flowering now anyway. So I might, if you're having trouble getting things to bloom in time, I would try to figure out how you can start your season earlier, plant the things that are hardy when they're little a little bit earlier in the year so they have a better chance of flowering later in the season. Um, Someone asked me about the like cupcake type zinnias, the crested or double ones. Is there some way to make them do what they're supposed to do? Uh, I welcome someone else's opinion on this. I've tried them in the past. We don't sell them, but anytime I tried them, you just get a handful of those double blooms. So it's just really unstable. I'm not sure what conditions it needs to do what we think it's supposed to do. Um, I don't know if the seed strains have been properly selected. That's one possibility. They're just showing you photos of the handful of pretty ones. Um, if someone's figured it out, crack that code, let me know. I'm happy to spread spread that word uh, far and wide. Um, so it's about tissue culture plugs. Do you think in the future you might be able to sell them in smaller quantities because of the hefty price tag? Uh, a little off topic, but yeah. Actually, most are going to be in trays of 25 instead of 50 this year to make it a little easier or for you to you know, try a wider range of the products. So we're one step ahead of you there. Um, tips for growing hellebores in a hot, very hot, dry summer climate in eastern Washington. Um, Dream Dirt Florals has about two dozen that have not been planted out in a permanent spot. Um, they're thinking about maybe in a high tunnel next to a sidewall. Um, hellebores, as long as they have enough water, they're not, they don't really mind too much summer heat. You know, they might go a little semi-dormant in the summertime, but um, you just gotta water them. They, they really want water, especially in the, you know, fall, winter, springtime, they need to stay really quite moist. Once they're established, they shouldn't have much trouble. Um, I wouldn't put them in full sun if you have really baking summers. In Vermont, I could grow hellebores in full sun, but I had heavy clay soil and we weren't ever that hot. Um, so I give them some shade. Um, yeah, they're really not that tricky. You just have to figure out how are you going to offer hellebores what they want. It, uh, not every plant is going to work in every location. So if you're having trouble with them, then maybe they're not good for where you want to grow them. Uh, so I'm asking where we're based now. We now live in Madeira, Portugal. Uh, Madeira is a little island, Portuguese island off the coast of Morocco. So we're on the same latitude as Atlanta um, and San Diego, actually. Um, we never get, we're actually probably cooler in the summer than um, Atlanta and probably warmer than San Diego is in the winter. So very mild climate. We moved here largely to grow flowers. Also, I'm often in Europe now, um, finding new varieties, talking to breeders, and getting new products back into the US. But we still have our team in the US and we all work remotely and it's working out really well. Okay, uh, someone had some trouble digitalis. Uh, Fox Love, the spring planted vernalized plugs did not bloom. 
So, they should have gotten enough chill. My only thought is, I, and I would, you know, I could probably look back. Those would have been shipped from Grow and Sell in Pennsylvania or New Jersey. Um, I forget where they hold those over winter. If it was a up and down, the winter had kind of ups and downs in temperatures, they might not have gotten enough chilling period. If you have a, you know, a week of normal cool temperatures in the winter time, and then you have a week where you're in the 70s, 70s or 60s, which we're seeing a lot now, um, that can actually undo the chilling period that was previously experienced by that plant. They keep track and it, and it goes up and down. So once they hit a certain level, then they'll initiate that flower and then they will continue to go. Um, I might say if to be more sure, plant something like Dalmatian or Camelot. These are first year flowering digitalis. Um, they're going to flower regardless. So you can plant them in October, November or plant them in you know, April, March, April of springtime. Um, yeah, shoot us an email about that. We'll, we'll try to figure out maybe what went wrong. Um, someone's having trouble with Rudbeckia hydration. That's not quite what we're talking about today, but uh, shoot us an email. I can you know, maybe look in the, the post-harvest handling book. Um, generally, if something's not hydrating well, either the plant doesn't have enough water when you cut it, um, maybe you're cutting at the wrong time of the day. So irrigate well the night before, cut in the morning, um, right in the cooler, you, you know, into a hydrating, it might need a hydrating solution or maybe just straight into a holding solution, but let it soak up um, those water, water nutrients in the cooler overnight. Um, oftentimes just that extra 24 hours in the cooler where it's not being, you're not asking the plant to transpire and drink at the same time, it's just drinking, um, can really change something that's wilting. Also cutting something a little too early will lead to wilt. Um, someone suggested, yes, you know, Stone Circle Farm is a good point. Also removing some of the foliage. You know, if you have something, it's really hard, that tiny little stem to bring all the water up to keep all the flowers and all the leaves hydrated. Just get rid of some of the leaves, you don't need them. Um, how to kill aphids. Um, they're really one of the easiest things to kill. There's a lot of organic and not organic things that will kill them. There's a lot of beneficials that will eat them. Um, I'll leave that to a pest control expert, but uh, same question about fully fluffy zinnias. Um, yeah, I don't know them. Um, I think it's it can it's just like I think it's usually a direct result of your conditions as to you know, how how full and big a flower is going to be. You know, I look at your make sure you're giving them as as much water and nutrition as they want. Um, but if you're having 110 degree heat and then you know these are really extreme conditions, you often see that stress exhibited in a malformation of the flower. <clears throat> Someone did chime in, again, about zinnias, about the double and crested ones. Um, they're more double when the plants are generally very healthy and not stressed. So, you know, that all comes down to water, nutrition, airflow. Um, zinnias are really great because they'll thrive under a lot of bad conditions, but they might be ones that really have to, you know, these super double types, I think, have to be, uh, you know, pampered just as much as anything else to achieve their full potential. Um, how does rust survive between seasons? It The spores overwinter in leaf matter in the grass. Um, you know, even on, you see rust on native solidago, a lot, of, a lot of native plants that can host it. And then, um, and it's, spores can blow in from hundreds and thousands of miles away. So even a big storm from the south can blow up rust from anywhere or anywhere along the way. So it's really impossible to eradicate it from the environment unless you're growing in a completely, um, like, very small net around your entire greenhouse situation. Um, it's true that cafe au lait should not be fully open to reveal the center. I'm not quite sure what that means. Um, sometimes, especially later in the season, cafe au lait, you will see open centers on it. It's just responding to day length. Cafe au lait is a, it's from the 60s. So it's almost an 80 year old variety. Um, really a horrible cut flower, amazing color. Um, I know a lot of people made a lot of money on cafe au lait, but they're really, really fussy about, they respond very, 
They're very reactive to their environment. So they really need everything to be perfect. And you're going to get your best flowers, um, well, probably about now, maybe over the last few weeks. As the day length declines, days get shorter, you'll probably start seeing more open centers. Um, okay, there's been a lot of people asking about eucalyptus. And I would also welcome, uh, what are your tips for eucalyptus? I grew it in Vermont in my high tunnel, little short season. So eucalyptus comes from Australia, it comes from the bush. There's a lot of different species of eucalyptus, but by and large, they want a lot of heat. Once they're established, they don't mind being on the dry side, um, but they need enough moisture to keep them growing. Um, there again, you can get some mildew issues on them if you don't have good airflow, if you have a lot of humidity and the leaves aren't drying out. Um, yeah, I, I, welcome, I welcome feedback because I was never great at eucalyptus. Um, I would usually cut it in September, October, just one harvest and my farmer's market customers loved it, but I wasn't getting these big, tall stems. It's slow to get started. Um, so if you're in a situation, maybe zone seven or eight, where you could keep them in a high tunnel, maybe in the middle bed of your high tunnel, mulch over it so you can keep them into their second year. The second year, they're gonna grow 10 times faster than they do their first year. Um, once they get going, they really wanna bake. Think like the Australian sun, they really want a lot of heat. Um, Yep, another person in San Diego saying that um, mildew can be an issue. There's a bug out there that eats leaves. You know, places like California, places like right here in Madeira, Portugal, we have a lot of eucalyptus trees around. You know, they've kind of, they're certainly not native. They're a bit, they're really quite invasive and a really bad fire risk because the volatile oils in the leaves catch on fire very easily. But uh, if you live around a lot of eucalyptus, you're probably more likely to see um, eucalyptus uh, pests. Yeah, la, la Osita Adobe is tortoise beetle. Thanks for that. Um, they've said they're happy to offer some ideas. Um, yeah, I was actually out in that area back in August. And it was really fun to see all the eucalyptus and even clearly some that were being grown for cut production. Just kind of hedges that, you know, we're just baking out in the sun, not much water. Um, you can tell that's that's what eucalyptus wants. So think think kind of a arid inland uh, Southern California. And if you can replicate those those conditions, I think you're in good shape. Um, all right, I think that's the questions we've got. We've been going for an hour now. So I'm gonna sign off here unless something comes back. Uh, oh yeah, Fallbrook, that's exactly where I was. Maybe we drove by your place. <laughs> um, I'm gonna shoot you a message, how funny. Um, Great. So I'm just going to encourage you to think like a plant. You know, if you're ever being frustrated, don't don't be emotional about it. Don't just because you read saw a pretty picture doesn't mean it's going to just grow. Um, some things are easier than others. Absolutely. Some things do have a trick. And once you figure out that trick, you can see the problem coming and you can fix it before the problem happens. But uh, take every failure as an opportunity to to learn about what went wrong. You know, maybe this plant is uh, not for you. Maybe this plant just needed one little thing that you didn't get right this year, but try again. Um, oh, I didn't talk about Lysianthus. I've talked a lot about Lysianthus in the past. Um, I'll just answer this one question that's in front of me. How much water should Lysianthus in a tunnel take? Um, Lysianthus wants water when it's young. You know, they come from stream sides in the prairies, southern prairies of the United States, actually. So they, they're used to having some rain and some moisture when they're small. They have very, very deep roots. They go very deep in the ground. So as long as there is a little moist layer somewhere down there, you, the Lysianthus is, is going to find it. But when it's a little baby plug, it can't find it. The roots are confined to that one little plug. So for those first couple of weeks, you're gonna really need to hand water and keep them on the moist side. And otherwise, just fairly general, um, general, general moisture is what I would, I would offer them if available. Late in summer, if you miss, miss watering, not gonna be a big problem. All right, as always, email us, info at farmerbailey.com. We are here to help, um, particularly with products that we've provided you with. We wanna see you succeed. Um, there's gonna be failures and there's gonna be successes. We actually wanna hear about them both. So let us know what's going well for you also. Um, I know we kind of focused on the problems today. Lenny Larkin's book, um, Flower, 
Flower Farming for Profit. There it is. Um, available now on Amazon. Please go on and pre-order that. Support Lenny, but also I know she's a great thinker and a great writer. Really a fun speaker if you get to hear her speak. I think she'll be at ASCFG in November. Um, I've already ordered a couple copies. Um, I think it's something we all will want to have on our shelf if we are in the business of flower farming. All right. Thanks, everyone. Stay tuned. We'll have a lot more products to talk about in the next couple of weeks. Again, October 2nd is when uh, the next big restock is. That'll be for Grow and Sell and also our West Coast um, provider. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm working for you. So just, just hang in there. All right. Thanks. Bye.